Well, good afternoon. I see that we have participants joining our webinar today. So we're gonna give a few minutes for that number to click up and let everyone get in. We have just over 120 or so participants registered. And it looks like we're at about 70 right now joining the room. And it looks like we're at almost 80. We'll give it just another moment. Okay, we're, we're at about 85 people. Uh, that number's steadily going up. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. I know that we've got a very full webinar ahead of us with some great presenters. And we need to maximize every moment. And as people join, they can pick up. Um, presenters, if you um, could limit any background noise or mute your own mic, and we'll get started here. So good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Budget Reductions, A Look Back to Look Forward. My name is John Warner, president of the California Adult Education Administrators Association, CAIA and Executive Director of Sequoia's Adult Education Consortium. Today's webinar is a joint effort with the California Adult Education Administrators Association, CAIA, and the California Council for Adult Education, CCAE. Fiscal reductions are not new to adult education. In 2008, adult education suffered the worst fiscal, fiscal cuts in its 150 year history. Those charged with leading in adult education have many considerations to balance as they navigate times of economic uncertainty and fiscal retraction. From urban to rural and large to small programs, these veteran administrators joining us today to present to you all with fiscal cuts in their bones will share how they led during the great fiscal crisis of 2008 with an emphasis on applying lessons learned to our current situation. Sorry, a little technical difficulty here. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping uh, points. Um, I have a couple of logistic items to share with you. If you're viewing us on your computer, there is a chat area in the bottom of your screen where you'll be able to type in questions that you may have during the presentation. We will be monitoring the chat box and we'll bring those questions to the presenters at the end of the webinar. Many of you asked if the webinar will be recorded. The answer is yes, and a link will be shared in the CAIA and CCAE websites. Today's budget experts are, and presenting in this order, Christian Nelson, Director of Oakland Adult and Career, Tech, uh, Career Education and past president of CCAE. Chris is also a former State Director of Adult Education at the CDE. Kathleen Porter, Executive Director of Career Technical Adult, Edu Adult and Alternative Education at Poway Unified School District, and the current CCAE State President. Larry Ann Torres, Director of Tulare Adult School, COAB Region 8 Representative, and the CCAE State President during the 2008 budget crisis. Laura Chartier, Coordinator, Program and Policy Development for DACE at LA Unified, and former School Board President, at Culver City School District. Steve Curial, uh, CAIA Vice President of Legislative Action, CCAE Past President and Principal at Huntington Beach Adult School. Thank you to each of them for providing very timely insights to budget management in adult education. And now I'll turn the uh, webinar over to Chris Nelson. 
Thank you, John. Thank you for all of you for being here today and joining us today. Um, we're really pleased to have this uh, presentation for you today. Yes, um, we expect some tough, tough times coming up ahead of us here, um, but we've been there before and we will be able to overcome again. So um, just want to keep that in mind. One word to think about throughout my little presentation here, my few minutes, think about the word indispensable. Um, and we'll, I'll be referring to that throughout this. Um, so here we are uh, looking at a brief look back uh, where we were um, back in uh, 2008. Very few people saw what was coming, but we were warned because we had about $750 million for the adult education program at that time. At that time, Oakland was the fifth largest adult school at that time. But as you can see in 2008-09, um, we had a large staff, but mid-year cut of 15%, um, we had to make some prior priorities. And the priorities were, um, the main one was our academic programs, our ESL and our high school diploma. The second level of priorities were our workforce programs. And then our third priorities was our social types of programs. So unfortunately, at the end of that year, we had to cut all of our social programs. Um, that was about 100 uh, older adult and adults with disability staff. Then in 10-11, um, we only had our ESL, our CBET classes, our high school diploma, GED, and CTE. But by 11-12, um, at that point, we went from, as you can see, we went from 13.9 million, 11.4 million, 4.4 to 1.9 million. And that left us with a very small staff of 60. But even then, we had more cuts, and that's where we had a million dollars at that point. Um, and, but that became our marker. At that time, um, maintenance of effort was uh, instituted in AD 86. Maintenance of effort um, meant that you had to make, uh, school districts had to keep their own funding at that level. AD 86 was planning dollars for the future. So that, that was good. But by this time, OACE had already lost 91% of its funding, of our funding. And in addition, we served less people because we also lost all of our Perkins grant funding. Um, that was 300,000 per year. And our WIOA Title II funding went from 1.6 million to about 200K, um, which is where we're at this, at, at this time. So by the time we hit the $1 million per year mark, we had to change our priorities again. And our priorities became what we can do for the district and what, how can we become more indispensable? And that's when we changed from CBET to family literacy and high school diploma to GED. And, it designed, and that was designed for students who were dropping out. So here, our ESL family literacy, this is what we did, what we made. We um, became uh, very, very uh, significant to our district by, because we were um, providing uh, parent and children time together as you can see here. Um, and also it was an opportunity for an ESL family literacy for, for parents to be able to understand their school and their culture. It was also a time for family literacy. Not only was family literacy teaching uh, parents their, the skills necessary for, to communicate with their school and their children, but also it was a workforce training program as well. Um, so, that was our, our family literacy program. It's a program that became a model recognized by the National Centers for Family Literacy. Um, we had a teacher of the year out of that. Um, the other thing is that program was really respected by our teachers and principals. Um, they really uh, were a big part of why we were able to stay. Um, our district noticed that. They, they held an annual parents day on a regular basis. And mainly it was our parents who were attending second language learners. They weren't reaching those second language learners. We were the main program that really reached out to that population. And there we became indispensable. For our high school um, diploma, uh, sorry, our high school equivalency, we found it, uh, that our district had a lot of at-risk students, 18 plus. We were in school and community locations and we started to produce some data outcomes for each year. And um, that was something that CCAE had suggested and still suggests to this day to, um, to really have some data outcomes on a yearly basis. 
This worked, as you can see, in 13, 14, we had 101 GED graduates. In many cases, that was more than many of our district's high schools. And so again, we became just indispensable. So, um, so we're gonna move on to the next slide. The next slide. Okay. Um, so make, remember to make your program indispensable. Your adult education program is a district program. And so make sure that it's part of that program, that you're serving parents, that you're serving at risk uh, young adults, 18 plus. Um, make yourself indispensable, not only to your district, as I'm saying here in this slide, but also to your consortium and uh, your community, your voters, their, you know, your community, our voters. So make yourself indispensable to them and also to your local workforce board. Um, you should do that as well. You're going to hear a little bit more about that from our other presenters. So I see I'm out of my time now, so I'm going to pass it on to back to John. Thank you, Chris. And we're getting uh, some great insights on relevance of adult ed to your regional com uh, community uh, and your local programs. Uh, we're getting a few comments in the chat box about audio <coughs> presenters. Uh, make sure you've got your microphone volumes turned up um, and that may help. It may be on the other end as well. Uh, just, you know, we're, we're all getting used to the Zoom issues as we, we use more and more Zoom. But thank you, Chris, very much. Very insightful. And now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Kathleen Porter. Well, thank you, John, and thank you, Chris. So um, I'm Kathleen Porter, and as you see, I'm with Poway Adult School, and Poway Unified School District is a large suburban school district in North San Diego County. Our, our district serves about 37,000 students um, in both the city of San Diego and in Poway, but we have a relatively small adult school for the size of our district. Um, and in 2008, when we started experiencing cuts and categorical flexibility, our adult education program, even though it was really small at the time, was cut by 65%. And um, so we felt happy that we weren't cut entirely. And I can still remember being called into the superintendent's office. And the superintendent said to me, you know, it's a lot more fun to build and grow a program than it is to retract and dismantle one. And I can tell you that from experience, he was exactly right. But some of the things that we did at that time um, as a whole district, not just in the adult school, but was to be really thoughtful about how we made cuts and how we decided what to cut or what to save money uh, with doing. And so I'm gonna share with you um, some of those uh, tidbits that we got at the time. And it's really looking at the problem through a variety of different lenses, um, a variety of different viewpoints. And so you've probably heard our legislative advocate, Don Kepke, talk about if you're not at the table, you're usually on the menu. And our assistant superintendent of human resources at the time in 2008 had a similar, um, <laughs> had a similar little thing to say. He would say, um, as the pie gets smaller, table manners deteriorate. And so um, one of the first things we did was to decide on guiding principles. And the guiding principles were really a foundation to help us preserve our table manners. So um, we all agreed that we wanted to maintain the focus on what was really important to us, what was our mission, and that was college and career readiness for each and every student. We all agreed that the first call on resources goes to the classroom. Uh, we all agreed we wanted to maintain a safe and orderly environment, and we all agreed that wherever possible, we wanted to retain staff and make cuts to things. 
We also took a lens of looking at what our core services uh, really are. And so when I think about that, I think what we were really uh, kind of focusing on are what, what are the must do's? Um, not the nice to haves, but what are the must do's? So if you've ever read Jim Collins, Good to Great, he talks about the hedgehog concept, really understanding what it is that your agency is good at, what you're meant to do. Um, also, in, um, if any of you, I'm dating myself here, but if any of you have seen the movie City Slickers, um, you'll know that Curly had a secret of life and he talked about one thing. What's that one thing that you're really good at doing? And so when we think about the core services, um, you know, what do we have to provide to our students, to our community in order for us to really be able to preserve our mission and our function? And and so that's what the core services uh, bullet there denotes. Um, the other thing we looked at was um, solving the problem in um, two ways. Number one, of course, we needed to figure out how to decrease expenditures. But we also wanted to be mindful of any way that we could possibly increase revenues. And so brainstorming about around both of those things. And then finally, the lens that we looked at evaluated possible cuts versus the cost of cuts. So to that, I would just say that all cuts are not equal because some cuts actually cost more because they affect our ability to increase revenues. They might affect our ability to um, attract or perform in grants. So if you think about your WIOA outcomes, um, if you're on the eligible training uh, providers list, cuts in some programs might affect your ability to um, receive revenue from outside sources. So I'm going to move on to the next slide, John. So in thinking about this, we really looked at what could we stop doing and what could we do differently? One of the things we know for sure is that we couldn't keep doing everything. And so it was really trying to um, get ideas about what could we stop doing without affecting our core services? And if it was something we absolutely had to keep doing, was there a way for us to be more effective in delivering that or more efficient in delivering that service? So I'm going to go on to the next slide, John. So here's just the process that we used. So we involved stakeholders um, and they got together and they brainstormed ideas against all of those lenses. What could we stop doing? What could we do differently? What cuts could we possibly make? How, what cuts might cost us more? And we just absolutely thought of every idea under the sun. We also asked for voluntary reductions. So if we had any employees who really were thinking about going to part-time and wanted to go part-time, we went ahead and moved um, ahead with that. So some things we were able to actually do without imposing anything on people. Um, let's see, so we kind of went through this process and I think it's just continuous improvement. Obviously, we made some decisions, we implemented changes, and then we checked back because we weren't, we didn't get it exactly right. So it's just something that we continually evaluated as we went along. Um, and then we'll go on to the last slide, John. 
So I liked that Chris was framing um, his topics under indispensable because that was also one of our strategies is we really looked at our internal partnerships and how our internal partnerships could either add revenue or add value. And actually it was an and add value, not one or the other. And so parent education, like Chris talked about family literacy, we were also doing those things things. Our district was providing high school credit recovery and wound up providing us with funding to do the high school credit recovery. Um, our, we had a number of different opportunities to do classified employee training. Some of that was helping our um, custodians um, prepare for um, passing the tests, um, our district tests to select custodians, bus driver training, programs, offering programs to our classified employees on professional growth days, all of those things we said, hey, we're going to go all in on this. Um, we also wound up taking over our district-wide foundation um, and our partners in education program because we were already out in the community meeting with employers and this was a way the district had been funding that program. The district could fund us to offer that program and we were just leveraging resources there. And then we also partnered with our district on a newcomer center, which, and we have two family resource centers in our district um, that we are partners in. So we might provide instruction to parents while they provide support and tutoring to students. So those are just some of the examples that um, we have used to um, increase our partnerships and to add value to our programs. So with that, I'll be quiet, turn things back over to John, and then he will introduce our next speaker, Larry Ann. Thank you, Kathleen. Wonderful tips, great ideas. And I just wanna you know, share with everybody on joining us today, you, the panel you've got are the absolute best of the best that I know and those that I turn to for best practices uh, in any situation, let alone um, looking at difficult things like budget constriction. With that, our next presenter is Larry Ann Torres from Tulare Adult School. Good afternoon. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, Kathleen and Chris as well. As I look back at the fiscal crisis of 2008, the practices that I'm gonna share with you today, these are the practices um, that kept Tulare Adult School open and relevant. I'm from a small rural urban high school district in the Central Valley of California. I feel very lucky to come from a district where the superintendent uh, back in 2008 and the superintendent today have been supportive uh, with a goal of keeping adult education alive and as a resource for the parents in the high school district that I serve and also the community um, that I serve. So looking at the budget best practices um, that I use then and I still continue to use now is get to know the chief business official in your district. I cannot stress how important it is to get to know that person the internal controls, setting up a process, make sure that you're getting a copy of your adult education budget. Um, you really need to be looking at that on a monthly basis. And again, the administrator at your site really needs to make sure that they're reviewing it and sharing that information with the team um, as a whole. Be prepared to educate your district finance staff on the adult education programs allowable uses guidance policy. Um, this is so important, but you also need to include your district's governing board as well. Make sure that you educate them on your adult education program and the budget. You need to know your budget software tools. An example of that would be NOVA today. Um, get familiar with that and make sure that you know all the ins and outs of that and, and the reporting uh, policies and procedures. The most important thing I can say is if you do not understand a report, you really need to make sure that you're asking questions. Send an email or pick up the phone and contact your chief business official in your district because that's so important. 
Moving on to the next slide. Look at your budget through the lens of the adult school's mission. Back in 2008, we had to cut our adult school program significantly. And basically at that time, we had to get rid of those programs that didn't have the added value that really matched our adult school's mission. And, and it really important too is our district's mission. And those are my adult school mission and my district's mission are really aligned pretty closely together. So really make sure that as you go back today, if you're having to um, start looking at cuts, not only for this year, but two outlining years, to really go back and look at, are you doing what your mission says that you're going to do? Also look at your consortium, the mission of your consortium. What does that look like today? Back then in 2008, we didn't have consortia across the state of California. So we didn't have that that we had to think about. But as we're uh, preparing for a possible uh, budget cuts today, we really need to keep that in mind. Look at all of your adult school programs. Identify those core programs and really look at them and make sure that those are programs that are valuable to what you're doing and that meet all the needs, not only of your site, but also the community and the partners that you serve. Look at it and review your data. What does your data say about your programs and about what you're doing, um, not only at your site, but for your community? Um, again, you really need to be looking at that data. Review the budget and the cost. Ask yourself, what am I paying for? And Am I paying, what am I paying for and why am I paying for it? I think that's a really important question as you look and review your budget. And then secondly, we need to really be looking at the whole cost. For example, when you look at staffing, are you including those statutory benefits and those health benefits when you're looking at your, your whole cost? And three, are you paying for um, the things that you should be paying for? I know when I sat down with my CBO, we really just kind of really went through with a fine tooth comb and just really looked at every single expense, even looking at things from internet and um, security guards and just all those other costs that um, are coming out of the adult school budget. Should I be paying for those or should that be coming from the district side? So really look at that and can you increase your cost for your C, you know, for example, from your CTE classes. And then know your funding sources, the total leverage funds. And I put a few examples here, like for my program, I received CAPE funding, also CalWORKs uh, fees for my programs, um, my CTE programs, my WIOA dollars, Perkins. And then I am lucky in that I, um, wrote a grant and receive employment training panel, but I would encourage all of you to continue to look at those additional funding sources that you can tap into, whether it's from your workforce investment board, from the employment training panel, but look at other grants that you could actually be writing that could help bring in those resources to your adult school and know your partners, align with your partners, leverage those resources. Again, the most important thing is to make sure that we maintain relevance, not only to our district, but to our consortium and the partners. We need to get connected and participate, uh, not only um, with, with our consortium, but more importantly with our district. For example, I participate and I'm part of my district's budget advisory. And so I would recommend each and every one of you to see if you can be a part of your district's budget advisory because that is how they put their LCAP um, together every year and as they're planning their budgets as well. So again, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Thank you, Larry Ann, uh, for a great perspective from a more rural region of our state. I appreciate that. Some great ideas there. And I, I get the benefit of working with Larry Ann uh, every day as, as her school is part of my regional adult aid consortium. 
Our next presenter is Laura Chartier. We're gonna get to see how the largest adult ed program in the state uh, mitigated fiscal retraction. Laura? Laura, check your mute. You may have uh, yourself muted. Oh, great, thank you. Hi, can you hear me now, John? Sounds perfect, thank you. Great, thank you. So thank you so much for, um, to the fel my fellow panelists for laying such a great foundation for this discussion. And what I'm gonna try and do is provide the cherry on top with some specific examples. In my role for LA Unified, I oversee the strategic planning and innovation. So what I wanna talk about is the lessons that we learned from the previous budget cuts. So, uh, before I do that, let me just show you a visual of what it looked like when we went from flexibility to uh, to when, when flexibility kicked in. So hello, flexibility. Goodbye days. Luckily, no, not goodbye days. But you can see from the picture on the left, we uh, cover 700 square mile area. We had about 400,000 plus enrollments, 30 plus schools. So all of those little blue dots, that's where we had a major adult education uh, school. And then we had to downsize. So we still had to cover the 700 square mile radius. Our enrollment uh, reduced to 150,000 because we only had 11 schools. So our key uh, strategy there was to still cover the geographic region and provide core services in the areas that had the most need. So one of the one of our strategies, because necess necessity is the mother of reinvention, was to reimagine some of our programs. And one of the programs that we really wanted to make sure that we reimagined were programs that were going to serve the families of our K-12 learners. So for example, out of that reimagining came the Family Success Initiative or FSI. And this is basically a program that is, it's an ESL program, but with the parent engagement module or um, it's a program that can be modularized based on the needs of the parents in the district. So for example, our summer offerings this year are gonna be focused on helping your students learn online. So the great thing about this program is it's still one of the core K programs, but it's modularized and flexible to meet the, need, the specific needs that our K-12 families need, needed. Our next strategy was to be a good partner, howdy partner. This is our DACE partnership map, and you can see the blue dots are where, where our schools are. And we, what we did was leverage our partnerships with the WorkSource Centers, the Department of Rehab, the County of Los Angeles, AJCCs, so that we could still provide services to the adult learners, but did it in a way that was we were leveraging our partners. So I think um, one thing that's really critical about this slide here is the downsize in the budget really forced us to examine what our role was as part of the workforce development system. And I think that reflection was very helpful to us as we developed our three-year strategic plan. Um, and it really, it helped us to, like I said, leverage many partnerships and be more clear of what our purpose was in the region. And then finally, um, many of the panelists have talked about leveraging. So for, for us, we had certain um, out of classroom advisors who were responsible for collecting all of our, um, our data for WIOA. So what we did is leverage those folks from one hat to many hats of opportunity. So what we're doing is kind of streamlining our data collection processes um, to, to generate more money. So there's more return on investment. 
So I think as you're looking at your budget, of course you wanna keep the cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. One of our strategies, however, in maintaining an out of classroom advisor was because we knew that the return on investment for that person's work was gonna be able to allow us to provide another 20 uh, uh, salaries for 20 other teachers. So um, that's why we kind of protected that specific position. So those are, those are all my cherries and hot fudge to our presentation today. John, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, some great ideas there to help schools uh, think creatively. Uh, so we've got a great perspective on ideas, how to make ourselves relevant, how to maximize the work that we do, how to think about work that we don't need to do, and, and ways to really stretch every dollar and make each dollar count for everyone in our region. So what's next? Next, we're gonna hear from Steve Curiel to talk to us about what can be next. Hey everyone. Hey everyone, I, I try to catch that, check off the uh, mute button, I forgot, but I got it pretty quickly. So uh, awesome, uh, I think awesome information being presented by my, our, our colleagues out there that uh, went through this already once and here we are again, uh, going through it again uh, in similar ways, maybe not so similar ways as well. So I want to talk a little bit about what uh, we have ahead of us um, I think one of the things that uh, stands out most to me right now as, as a principal at, at the time of the last recession, I was an assistant principal, so I was not necessarily privy to all the information and didn't definitely didn't have this bigger picture uh, regarding budgets and how to strategize for uh, uh, cuts and um, decisions being made from higher up. So now sitting in the seat, uh, there's a lot of information happening and uh, coming out right now, and it just doesn't seem like we have solid answers on a lot of things. And so one of the things we want to remind folks is the state budget process uh, is not done. Uh, the May revise is out um, and that is the governor's proposal. And uh, for the most part, I, I personally felt it was a, is a good budget in terms of adult ed and, and what we are uh, still asked to deal with. We're still, we've got some cuts to deal with, but uh, there's still a process that, that involves the legislature, uh, the assembly and the Senate. And as we speak, they are meeting on this budget proposal by the governor. And um, one of the things that I've been uh, hearing, uh, a couple of things I've been hearing from legislators is that one, they don't like the cuts at all to education. And these are, to be fair, these are the education subcommittees on uh, budget subcommittees. And so there, there's some concerns about um, the budget cuts and, and more, more so with the K-12 side of things. You don't hear a lot about the adult debt uh, cuts. You just hear them uh, referred to as categorical cuts, uh, but uh, definitely, a lot of concern and there's some good good news in terms of um, a resistance we'll say from uh, legislators department of finance to the idea of flexibility or further flexibility uh, we just heard from don our advocate that uh, the philosophy right now is that districts k-12 districts have full flexibility within L lcff and the idea of, of uh, bringing back another legis uh, flexibility legislation doesn't really make sense uh, because most of all the categoricals have already been absorbed within LCFF and districts again have full flexibility under their funding. So that's good news right now, but that's not necessarily uh, decided yet. Uh, June 15th is a deadline where they have to come to decision, so they're getting close to that. Uh, it'll, it'll go fast. But I want to remind folks, uh, those that are around or, or just share with folks that are new to this uh, scenario of budget cuts is that back in 0809, uh, we, we got we, we, for the first thing we heard was that budget cuts were coming. And the first thing was a 20% cut to adult ed. Uh, that was back again, uh, 09, uh, spring of 09. We hear about this 20% uh, cut to adult ed and we're, oh my gosh, how are we gonna deal with that? And then it was a flexibility concept that was emerging and we saw this list of different categorical programs and you were, you were put into different tiers as to what kind of flexibility your uh, districts would have over adult debt funding and other categoricals. And, uh, then all, and then at the end of it, flexibility was passed. And then to cap that off, um, they clarified uh, at the time uh, 
um, that not only could you tap into the current funding, the current apportionment for the adult ed, but then you could also take the reserves and flex that. So really it just got worse and worse as time went on. And it just, I mean, our heads were spinning, as you can imagine, trying to adjust and really took some time for the dust to settle and, and, and uh, adapt to our new world. But I say all that to say, again, this process is not over. Things can change. Uh, there's still a possibility of revisions in August uh, if the, uh, revenue projections that uh, the governor and legislature are basing their budget on don't come in. Uh, as you know, uh, the um, federal uh, the tax return deadline was pushed back to July 15th. So we're hoping all those tax revenues come in uh, as good or better than what what are projected for our uh, budget. But knowing that that can that can change, we have to be open for some possibilities in August. So all that to say again, uh, advocacy is key to what we're doing right now and protecting our funds. Um, as districts are pressured to cover their K-12 cuts, they're going to look for every pot of money, just like some of our, our stake, our, uh, colleagues were sharing that they looked at all their pots of money and how they could leverage them and, and how to avoid all cuts. They're going to be looking at other pots of money within their district funding and the adult ed is part of that funding that they see. Now, fortunately we're, we're under a, a consortium model that, that does provide some protections, but we cannot rely just on that. We need to keep telling our legislators that, um, the importance of adult ed that sometimes it is in fact more important uh, or just as important more important to protect the parents of the kids than than just the kids because that's the battle we get end up getting into is how do you fund adults before kids well I always go back to the analogy of uh, when you're on an airline uh, a flight and they tell you that when that if that oxygen mask comes down the first person you put the oxygen mask on is the adult and then the kid and so I think this, the concept here is, what, is we want to make sure our adults are able to help their kids uh, survive this, these cuts in this, this next uh, recession that we're going through. So I've got a link on there. We have a link on there, ccstate.org forward slash take action. And there you will find a first step uh, to, uh, or step one, where you can send a letter to your legislator. It makes it really easy. There's a drafted letter for you to use. And um, in an effort to make sure uh, we avoid that domino effect that I just spoke of. So uh, I encourage you to get involved. And I, I'm glad to see we got about 130 people, uh, some administrators, mostly administrators, some teachers, but we know there's probably more than 400 administrators out there dealing with these issues that we're all dealing with. And they're not hearing this. I don't know if they've, they figured it, they've got it all taken care of, but our concern is that folks aren't prepared. And that's why we're doing these, uh, uh, webinars and we hope that you reach out to your colleagues and, and get them involved, especially on our advocacy front to make sure we can we can weather this storm. And with that, I'll hand back to John. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to our presenters for the, the timely and great information. We now have some time for questions. I know this is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot here in this webinar. And so if you have specific questions, please uh, look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a chat function there and that's where we'd like you to post your question. If your question is directed at a specific panelist, please indicate who you're addressing your question to by typing their name before the question. You may type, my question is for Kathleen and then fill in your question. And I'm gonna double check our Q&A here real quick. I know we had a couple of questions there. So I'll start over there. And then if everyone else could um, refer over to the chat function. So one of the first questions uh, was from Toyby and it was Kathleen, thank you for sharing your experience. You mentioned stakeholders involvement. Who were some of the stakeholders you included at that time and how were they included? by selective invitation or open invitation. Could you please share those details? So Toyby, um, thank you for the question. And, um, you know, so we had two different groups. We had kind of these broad groups where it was an open invitation, anybody could come. And those um, groups were just to brainstorm ideas about um, ways to either um, decrease expenses or to increase revenues. Um, and then um, we had 
had a budget committee um, that was specially formed that was representative of stakeholder groups and also different areas in the region. And that group actually made the recommendations about now we've brainstormed all these ideas. Here are the recommendations that we think um, you should take a look at. So that was a smaller group. Um, people who wanted to be on that budget advisory committee um, submitted applications and then they were selected by our school board to um, to serve on the budget advisory committee. And um, I thought the process was a very thoughtful, fair, open, transparent process. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. So yes, uh, another question had to do with whether or not this webinar will be made public. It will be, it is being recorded and will be uploaded to both the CCAE and the CAIA websites. Another question that we had is, if our parents can't afford to live in your area, in an area they will move, then next year uh, the K-12 program will shrink anymore. Is there any, that's from Aaron, is there any thoughts or, or ideas on that from any of the panelists? I think, um, I think that is a consideration uh, to consider in planning is, is a reduction, potential reduction in enrollment. And I think that's all, you know, uh, the more reason to, to help focus on maintaining rev uh, uh, relevance to community partners to help mitigate any potential declining enrollment you may, ex you may experience. Uh, you know, you've got to work with your community partners to, to generate those referrals and access to your programs. Can I, Beth can I say something, John? This is sure. Hard. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in working with our workforce development partners during COVID-19, they've identified digital, digital literacy as a big area of need for our region. So we've created a four-week summer session that is just computer essentials for anybody, for construction workers, for uh, parents for anybody. So I think what we're trying to do is just be able to pivot quickly to address whatever needs come up for our K-12 families or for our workforce development partners. Thank you, Laura. And Laura, stay, stay, oh, sorry. Was there another add to that from Steve? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit about uh, that, that concept. And I think one of the things I, I would share with Aaron and the group is that we in adult ed, we get a different perspective. We get the bigger community perspective, the larger uh, a perspective that Im Im includes employment and uh, employment rates and getting people back to work and the impact on the economy, local economy. So we're in those conversations a lot. And uh, with all due respect to our boards and superintendents, I don't, I don't think, or at least I feel in my experience, the ones I've worked with, they, their focus is on kids and the education that's, that's uh, uh, mandated through our districts. And so they might not have, and I'm not saying this to everybody, but they might not, some of them might not have the broader perspective of that, uh, of that concept of if your parents are out of work and can't, be, can't get back to work, then they're gonna move out of the district. So I think being advocates for, for your impact on the com community and being out there and, and going to meetings, I know I go to meetings most of the time, they don't deal with anything that my adult school uh, anything to do with my adult school, but I'm there just to keep reminding folks that there's a community that we're supporting, that if the community is vibrant, and this I think I'm quoting from, uh, uh, I'm blanking on her name right now, but the, I think she's a, a deputy superintendent now in Oakland, Chris's uh, colleague, uh, that she said vibrant communities uh, lead to vibrant families. And so continue to, to explain that, but I think sometimes that's a harder concept for, for folks, and especially in the decision-making level at, at like cabinet and so forth to get that piece. Thank you, Steve. Laura, I wanted to come back to you. Uh, there's a question from Beth Cutter uh, re with regards to the Family Success in Initiative. Can you tell us a little more about that curriculum and is that curriculum available to be shared to others around the state? Yes, so the Family Success Initiative is a program that empowers families to support student success by teaching the skills to connect with, participate in, and become leaders within their school communities. So 
we took the ESL uh, class course and for classes that are being offered at the elementary schools within LA Unified, the, the content of that course became more about helping parents learn how to navigate the K-12 system. And so some of the outcomes are that these parents become more involved in the PTA, they've become uh, more in involved in the school site councils, they have a better understanding of how to get their, um, how to help their ch children redesignate out of being an EL learner into the regular uh, curriculum. Um, but like I said, this is kind of us reimagining our ESL program for those school, those classes specifically offered at the elementary school. We also have some at the middle school as well. But if you would like, we have a whole uh, web page devoted to the Family Success Initiative. If you go to We Are DACE, so DACE is D-A-C-E, stands for Division of Adult and Career Education. So wearedace.org. And you can look at the web, website that um, has a lot of materials and information about the program. And I posted that uh, into the chat for everybody. Uh, Laura, we have another question from Pam for you with regards to the, um, the WIOA hat position and the changes that, that were made to that role. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that position changed as they took on other funding area data? Right. So basically, you know, we have this, we had this position historically, we called them a WIA advisor. And um, they are in charge of collecting all the data for WIA. But then of course, the, that role became expanded as we were collecting additional data for CAPE. And then just in the past couple of years, what we've been doing is integrating the data that's collected for Perkins through that office and just leveraging that position for the data data collection because in the past you we looked at this position it's we thought okay this is somebody who's going to support esl abe and ase programs but that's not ne necessarily necessary it can they can support cte programs and their data collection as well and i, I guess the part that we did that i felt was really was good and it may it was kind of hard to do because people looked at that position and they were like wait a second they're not teaching students we protect we put like a, a barrier around that position at each school so all 10 schools have one of those and that they they basically generate you know 20 times their salary in outcome you know in outcome performance thank you Laura, and an open question again from Toyby to any of the panelists that with more distance learning programs uh, start to uh, emerge across the state, uh, whether it's in your K-12 or diploma, dig digital literacy, uh, devices become um, an important feature of that and, and getting students access to devices. What are some strategies you are uh, experiencing or considering for your own programs with regards to devices. And Toyby, if it's okay, I'm gonna throw in on that question, internet connectivity, because I think it goes hand in hand with device access. So John, this is Larry Ann. In regards to devices, um, you know, my school was very lucky in that we did purchase devices. However, um, you know, those were typically for the classroom and not necessarily for checkout purposes as we went to um, fully online um, during this COVID time. However, we did start checking out devices um, to the students who needed devices, but also I reached out to the Employment Connection, our uh, America's Job Center, and they have dollars that um, in our area um, are they're able to help students um, purchase devices and even with um, Wi-Fi and so that is a resource I would also look at um, Sprint also has um, resources out there um, available to districts in regards to getting Wi-Fi for students so our district we're very lucky in the fact that all of our students have 
Wi-Fi available to them as well because we were a part of a um, an award um, to get those with our for all of our students. And so I would really look at um, reaching out to some of those providers to see if they can assist you um, in your school and getting that resources for your students, for your adults. Thank you, Larry. And any other panelists? We have time for maybe one more uh, comment on that question. Um, John, I can just speak to that a little bit. Um, Toyby, because um, like you, we're part of a K-12 school district. We actually included our adult students in the surveys that went home to families to see about needs for devices and also for internet access. And so as a result of that, then we checked out Chromebooks um, to students and um, are providing hotspots to students when our local K, uh, our local internet providers aren't able to do so. So I think it's just another way of um, a, a, an opportunity for adult ed to kind of push into the structures that um, our K-12 systems are already doing as they survey uh, students. We actually had very few of our adult ed students that said they needed a Chromebook, but we did have a few that we were able to provide. Thank you, uh, Kathleen. And Steve mentioned in the uh, comments, don't forget to build up good tech support infrastructure to support students who might not know how to use the equipment. And, and I would add on to that, and I'm sure everyone's engaging this, uh, good support for your teachers as they uh, engage students. And then we have one, one last question here from Lisa with regards to ABE, ASC, and ESL students. Lisa, I don't know if I understand the question, um, if you could maybe rephrase it for us. It's where, where are these ABE, ASC, and ESL students? I'm not sure if I understand exactly what you're asking. John, can I also, while you're waiting for her to respond, just want to mention that your workforce partners may also be able to help you with devices and um, internet access. Great, thank you. I think she's referring, Lisa's might be saying, were these ABE, ASE, and ESL students? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so were they those students that were receiving? So yeah, were you guys applying or providing uh, equipment and services to those program areas or was it all program areas? John, this is Larry Yan. It was all program areas um, for us here um, at Tulare Adult School. Okay. Yeah, LA Unified did all program areas too. Very good. Okay, um, I'm going to move us along. It's uh, 12.57 by my clock. And so to honor everybody's time, uh, we do have a slide here with some res additional resources as you plan and move forward. This is not the complete exhaustive list, but these are uh, great resources for you to turn to as you move forward. And I want to remind everyone that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on both the CCAE website and the CAIA website. And in close, I want to call everyone to action. Um, our, our role in adult ed as administrators, as instructors, as um, frontline staff reaches way beyond our day jobs, it seems. It was a lesson I learned when I came into adult ed. Uh, part of the hat, or, or one of the hats that we put on is informing our local electeds and helping them understand the, the importance of our programs and why K-12 adult education matters to our communities. And this easy to remember URL will take you to the CCAE um, K-12 adult ed matters toolkit in five simple steps, you can have a voice with your elected representation. And in final closing, I want to really thank our partners, Burlington English, First Financial, GED Testing Service. Without them, events like today's webinar and broader, further reaching work that we do in our communities just isn't possible. They support us in the classrooms, they support us with best practices, and they support us in the broader 
forefront of implementing adult education for California. And I wanna thank all of the panelists. Again, this is a very um, functional, uh, high capacity. I would call these guys the heavy hitters of adult education presenting to us today. And I wanna really thank them for taking time out of their, their own schedule to share their wisdom and insight with all of us. And thank you to everyone for tuning in today. And with that, we'll close the webinar.